So next up, so we all know that technological advances in healthcare are already and will continue to have significant benefits for patient health and the economies throughout the region. But these technological advances also come with many emerging ethical dilemmas. Uh, no doubt the next session will be uh, of great interest to all of you. And we certainly will, will have lots and lots of participants uh, tuning in for, for this next, up, next session. We are honored to welcome two luminaries, Phil Febo, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Illumina, who is joining us from San Diego to discuss emerging ethical dilemmas in patient data with a spotlight on genetic data. Uh, Phil, on my way to the office today, I saw an electronic billboard by Illumina that said fighting COVID-19 through unlocking the power of the human genome. So quite relevant to our discussion today, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you. Before I turn it to you, Phil, after Phil has the chance to speak with us today, we will hear from Julian Durand, Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for Sanofi, Chair of the Future Health Technologies Working Group of the Ethics and Business Integrity Committee at the IFPMA, or the International Federation of Pharmaceutical Manufacturers and Associations. Julian is also a global expert on digital health and AI at the World Health Organization, Julian is joining us from Paris, and he'll be discussing emerging ethical dilemmas in health technologies with a spotlight on artificial intelligence, two really important topics all. Gentlemen, welcome. And Phil, I turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Andrew. And uh, thank you for the organizers for the opportunity to participate in such an important meeting and to provide my perspective as Chief Medical Officer for Illumina, a company that manufactures sequencers and is increasingly providing insights that are essential to manage health and healthcare. I'm a physician scientist and a medical oncologist, and I've dedicated my career to accelerating the utilization of molecular and genomic information to improve patient management and outcomes. I've spent my career in academia and in industry. In addition, I am of Italian and Welsh heritage. I have a family history of cancer on my mother's side, a cardiovascular disease on my father's side, and my cholesterol is a little high, and I do not have hypertension and diabetes. Now, you may ask why I'm sharing that personal information. And when focusing on the ethical issues inherent to genomics and genome sequencing, I posit that there's nothing more personal than our genome. If you had access to my genome, you could know all the information that I just chose to share. Once you have my genome, you would be able to understand uh, my ancestry, disease susceptibility, ability to tolerate certain medications, as well as my eye color, hair color, skin tone. And with some help from artificial intelligence, you could build a very good three-dimensional model of what I look like. With knowledge of our genomes growing exponentially now uh, and providing increasing amount of information about us, not only as an individual, but as a family and a community. As a physician, I understand the incredible potential benefit that genomics can offer all of us. As a son, husband, and father, I also understand the potential risks to my family's privacy and my community's privacy. Genomic data is starting to be readily available through large population-based studies, including genomes from individuals across many countries. According to a report in Nature last year, more than 83,000 researchers from 146 countries downloaded 6.7 petabytes of DNA data from one of the European um, databases. This is the equivalent uh, amount of data to 89 years of continuous high definition video. And the scale and availability of genome data will only increase. G4, GA4GH, a group dedicated to establishing standards for genomics research and genetic data use, anticipates that by 2025, more than 60 million pa patients worldwide will have their genomes or exomes sequenced as part of routine healthcare. While this represents just under 1% of the global population, it is only the beginning. At Illumina, we work towards ensuring that all research conducted or supported by Illumina is designed to advance health and scientific knowledge while identifying and minimizing risk. Illumina is proactive and stringent in ensuring health, safety, and dignity of research participants in the clinical trials we perform. And we abide by all re relevant legal and regulatory requirements and the standards set by the World Medical Association's De Declaration of Health Helsinki. To ensure we do not get too myopic in our interpretation of benefits and risk, Illumina seeks guidance from our Ethics Advisory Board on bioethical topics on a quarterly basis. Since 2008, 
the Ethics Advisory Board has advised and provided recommendations on ethical issues, policies, and regulations relevant to genomics industry. These types of checks and balances are critical for all institutions. Let me share a few examples. In February 2019, Thermo Fisher decided to no longer sell sequencers to the Zhejiang region of China because of well-publicized reports of Chinese government misuse of genomic sequencing products. While this was an egregious use of the technology and Thermo took appropriate measures, there are other potentially well-intentioned uses that raise significant ethical concerns. Here in the United States, on July 5th, 2018, uh, Health and Human Ser Services Secretary Alex Azar announced the decision of, for US government to test the DNA of migrant children held in order to expedite the reunification of families who are separated under the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy on border crossings. While this may seem a logical approach to some, this approach raises many ethical issues and immigrant rights group immediately expressed appropriate concern. In another example, Canadian border authorities were using DNA test results and specifically ancestry information from an individual's genome to choose which country to deport migrants. The immigration authorities told reporters that DNA testing was only used for long-term detainees where other methods of, to establish identity had been exhausted and that testing was only performed after consent. Again, perhaps a logical solution, but there are major issues with consenting incarcerated individuals and in today's highly mobile world where families are very often displaced from their ancestral homes, there are major flaws in using ancestry to determine country of origin. While the ethical concerns raised uh, by genomic and genetics and genomics are broad, the key ethical principles that are critical to genomics are autonomy, privacy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. These key principles are manifested in best practices when conducting genetic and genomic research and genetic testing on individuals and working with genomic data. I'll now discuss some different elements and connect them to the ethical principles. Consent to participate or to be tested is often the beginning for anyone who engages in genomic research or testing, and it's key to address autonomy. It is critical that consent is informed and voluntary when genomics are used to provide information, healthcare or other, for an individual. The examples by the US and Canada that I mentioned above underscore how consent does not always adequately address autonomy. For children separated from their caregivers, can they provide informed consent? For detained immigrants, can, they, can the consent really be voluntary? Also, if any of you have participated in clinical trials, you know how long consent forms can be, often more than 10 pages. And I've run trials where the consent was over 30 pages long. And despite their length and complexity, they're primarily focused on the research at hand. They seldom cover all the future potential uses of samples and data gathered in the setting of research or routine clinical testing. Ideally, providing the research participant the option to opt out or opt in of future studies using samples or data resulting uh, from the primary research uh, objective is ideal. And to fully benefit from our, an understanding of our genomes, it is impracticable to consent every participant for every potential use of their sample or data. Thus, ethically appropriate mechanisms have been established for investigators to get exceptions to specific consent. Even one of the most stringent data use regulations, the European General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, that often gets spoken about in these situations, recognizes an, an exception for to specific consent to allow participants' data to be used for certain areas of scientific research. Of course, for this to work, safeguards must be in place to protect patient identifiability and thus ensure the research is aligned with the ethical concept of privacy. De-identification is a process of removing information that could be used to directly identify the patients from data used in the research, such as name, address, date of birth, and others. In today's world, there is great debate about whether we can truly de-identify a person's information. There was some work done at the Imperial College of London and Belgium's Catholic University in Louvain, where they could correctly re-identify 99.98% of individuals in anonymized data sets with only 15 demographic attributes. So, in, and especially now with genetic research where de-identified data may contain sequences of your genome, it is even more difficult for samples to be truly identified and anonymous. 
As a result, a key element of research, genomic research that de-identifies patients uh, is controlling access uh, to the data, ensuring data is stored securely, ensuring that anyone who has access to the data is one, a qualified investigator, and two, performing research that is scientifically sound and aligns with the ethical constructs of privacy, beneficence, and non-maleficence is very important. Additionally, with the growing use of cloud-based compute and storage, together with increasingly sophisticated hacking efforts, secure storage has to be directly addressed for big data research. The benefits of successfully addressing these concerns and performing big data big data genetic research are quite clear. With advances, including artificial intelligence, as we aggregate hundreds of thousands to millions to tens of millions of human genomes, we'll be able to more precisely understand the genetics of heart disease, diabetes, mental illness, and many other diseases. It is estimated that 30% of our individual health is determined by our genetics, and yet we understand only very little of the ways to use that information. As we understand more of the information in human genetics, it becomes important that individuals have access to their data and have medically relevant results returned to them. Just this past year, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and the ACMG increased the number of genes where secondary findings should be reported to patients from 59 to 73. And this number will undoubted, undoubtedly increase over time as we understand more. Of course, this exception expectation is somewhat in conflict with measures taken to ensure privacy. Anonymization means that the individual can no longer receive results as no further communication is possible. Anonymization also challenges the ability to ensure research subjects have a right of withdrawal. The right of withdrawal is, a manifestation, is another manifestation of autonomy and where a patient can choose to stop participating in research. In truly anonymized data, this is impossible. However, there are increasing mechanisms by which this element of patient autonomy can also be respected. All these elements come together uh, and really present uh, us with challenges and opportunities. The growing awareness of genetics and genomic research and genome editing have surfaced during this pandemic. With the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, so too emerged conspiracy theories about the origins of the virus. One theory blamed the United States for bioengineering the virus. The other, oh, another blamed China for the same. Both were groundless. However, these theories highlight the broad appreciation that as we understand human genetics and genetic variation between ethnicities, the pathogenesis of infectious disease and have the ability to manipulate, manipulate both human and pathogen genomes, there is risk to leverage these technologies for bioterrorism. Some national regulations likely driven by this concern forbid samples and or data to leave the nation of origin. While superficially protective, these policies are likely to be ineffective and may end up hurting the very populations they are tended to protect. First, if nothing else, the pandemic has demonstrated how globally connected we are, not only by technology, but physically. Many countries have experienced a sufficient diaspora that there are many individuals reflecting the genetic pool of the country across the globe. Thus, for most countries, there is no containing a nation's genome. Second, by enforcing overly restrictive rules with respect to sharing of samples or data, that country may not fully benefit from the breakthroughs based on genomic research. To me, this ties in with the just of con the concept of justice, and specifically that there is equal access to genetic and genomics and the derivative insights that can improve human health. In conclusion, as we gather, albeit virtually, to consider health ethics in the Americas, it is critical to consider the key ethical principles that are inherent to genetic and genomics research, autonomy, privacy, beneficence, and non-maleficence, and justice. While there's great opportunity for be benefit, there are challenges and some alignment of conduct will need to be established within and across the Americas. How can the Americas come together to establish appropriate international code of conduct that recognizes the opportunity and risks and lays out a path to success? How can this international code align with established international regulatory laws so that the Americas can meaningfully participate in global genomic research to maximize benefits to our communities? How can this work be performed in an inclusive manner so that the full diversity of populations within the Americas participate and benefit? I apologize about ending 
with questions rather than answers, but I do see this virtual conference as a beginning and look forward to participating and developing answers together. Thank you, Andrew. Wow, thank you so much, Phil, for that extraordinarily insightful um, you know, series, series of thoughts. Um, boy, I don't even know where, I'm sure where to begin, whether it's um, you're noting that re-identification is real in the context of, of genomics and control becomes very important. I think this is the first time I've seen so clearly the connection between future ethical dilemmas and decision-making with cybersecurity. And then of course, I think as folks across the Americas will know uh, about your information, uh, I, I like your statement here, Phil, there is no containing a nation's genome when it comes to, to uh, various diaspora communities across, across the region. Truly fascinating stuff, Phil, and we hope that you'll continue this conversation with us and, and, and all those stakeholders across the region. So I'd now like to turn the floor over to Julian, um, who will be sharing perspectives with all of us again on emerging ethical dilemmas in health technologies with a spotlight on artificial intelligence. Julian, it's wonderful to see you, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, hope you guys can hear me properly. Wonderful, okay. So thank you so much, Andrew, uh, for the opportunity. As always, wonderful to partner with you uh, and uh, in this summit of the Americas. Uh, um, I, I think it's good to be actually on the tail end of Phil because he was talking a lot about data uh, and I'm gonna talk about artificial intelligence. And, and as we know, AI is actually a big consumer of data. So that's the input to the output I'm gonna discuss. So that I think is, is, is a good setup for, for this presentation. So I, I'd like to anchor a little bit uh, the audience on AI in health, because uh, I think many people mean different things by AI. And that's important that we have a little bit uh, of an alignment here so that we can better understand both the opportunities, but also the dilemmas attached to artificial intelligence in health. So a good way to look at it is I think uh, through two spectrums. The first one is uh, the spectrum of autonomy, and the second one is the spectrum of intelligence. So if you look at it from um, the autonomy perspective, um, the first stage in evolution is human perform 100% of the tasks, and, and, and AI or any form of automation performs none of it. Then humans perform the main task, but is assisted in the background by machine, uh, and, and that's a, a great first step in the evolution towards autonomy. Third step is the machine takes over and perform most of the task. And we have a human assistance in the background. You can call it human oversight uh, or any other form of, of type of support until the machine reach full autonomy and is able to perform all the tasks in full autonomy. So we are not there yet. Uh, we are somewhere there in the middle uh, in what uh, MIT call human machine collaboration. Understanding that human in isolation and machine in isolation are currently not as good as both combined together. And that's what the next 10 years uh, in healthcare is gonna be about, uh, human and machine collaborating together and understand how to do that better over time. The second area uh, is, 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 is looking at it from an intelligence perspective. At the bottom of the, of the spectrum is automation. We're just gonna repeat a routine task. There's not really any form of intelligence in there. Then you move into artificial narrow intelligence. So that is a form of artificial intelligence dedicated to doing one thing. Think about you know, playing poker or go or chess. That's all it does. It does it very well, but it does nothing else. And then you move into artificial general intelligence, similar to human beings, the ability to actually uh, apply intelligence to many different fields and connect it together until you reach what some call artificial super intelligence. Think about you know, those algorithms becoming so smart and learning so fast that they're gonna outperform human being and reach a point, point called singularity where machine are smarter than human. So that's a bit sci-fi on the right side, but we already have a lot of application in the autonomy uh, from a, a, an automation perspective and artificial narrow intelligence, making slow progress towards artificial, artificial general intelligence. Here you have um, you know, some of the enablers and challenge to AI in health. So the first enablers uh, is that we can see an accelerated digitalization of, uh, of healthcare and the large amount of health data being produced, which is great because that's what comes into algorithms. The second area is we can see a lot of progress as well into uh, algorithmic design and, and evolution of AI, whether that's for structured or unstructured data analysis. Uh, and the third area is 
for a period of time, uh, uh, computer power was actually superior to algorithms and software. Then algorithm and software made progress. And we're now reaching a stage where they're starting to consume a huge amount of, of, of processing power. And we can see now an acceleration in that field, which is good. From the challenge on the technology side, we still are in healthcare um, uh, facing some issue around harmonization and data quality and integrity. It's, it's very diverse. Uh, and we can still see also issues around how we share data, what are the challenges around interoperability, a lot of hospital providers, uh, government and public institution, pharmaceutical companies, and so on and so on, are actually all having their own different systems that don't talk to each other or limited. And so that doesn't favor the ability to integrate all those data, structure them in a way that we can gain greater insight. It's also still very labor intensive as we're progressing through AI. And there are a lot of ethical and societal implications. And that's what we're going to take a, a, a look at very soon. The other area of interest when you look at AI in healthcare is it's not a single layer. It's what I call a dual layer. The first layer is the digital technology layer. So think about algorithms, think about mobile health, uh, blockchain, digital biomarker, virtual reality, telemedicine. Those technology live in the digital world, right? 100%. But you also have in healthcare and particularly in future health technology, a physical layer. If you think about uh, you know, robotic surgery, exoskeleton, smart pills and implant, gene editing and 3D bioprinting technology, they are physical technology. But how do you think the pill is smart or the implant is smart? It is smart because combined with the physical layer, we have the digital layer and AI is not only applying in the, in the virtual world, it's also applying in the physical world as well. And so AI is pretty much everywhere around us when we talk about it in, in, in healthcare. So let's quickly look at some application before we dive into the ethical dilemmas. So you can use uh, you know, AI in healthcare in research and, and medical. Think about medical imaging, diagnosis, prognostic AI. That's what the HCPs are using. You can look at it from a, 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 an industry perspective, better discovering and designing clinical trials, patient assistant program, electronic medical records. You can also look at it through the lens of the healthcare system in itself, how to use AI to better design health strategies for authority or uh, be better at health surveillance and epidemiology, or even what we're seeing now, emergency preparedness and pandemic response, uh, but as well as how to promote better health, which population to target, how payers uh, can also automate and enhance the decision-making process or providers and hospital optimize their uh, uh, health processes and protocols. But many other technology also combined with AI like augmented reality, for example, like health internet of things, a lot of those different um, tools that we may be using in daily life, whether they're smart implantable, smart watches, smart toothbrush or smart pills are combining physical technology with artificial intelligence. And you can apply that as well to robotics and health robotics. Uh, if you think about robo surgery uh, in the future, even robo nurses, brain computer interfaces, exoskeleton also need uh, this AI layer. Um, so what that means is AI is everywhere. And so we know about uh, the opportunities, but let's look at some of the ethical dilemmas. Um, Jonathan Zitrain, who is a, a professor at Harvard University, made a very interesting analogy between AI and asbestos. You know, asbestos, this uh, compound which is used for building insulation. And we realized that it was creating cancer because there were micro particles that were released in the environment that people were breathing. Uh, and he's saying it's like asbestos. You didn't ask for it, you don't realize it, but before you, you know, you just, you know, become conscious about it, it's embedded everywhere around you in the building. And AI is the same. And before you realize it, it's going to take decision uh, and he's going to actually be in control or many of the healthcare decisions that we have around us and deeply impact patients overall. So what he's saying is let's do it by design and the importance of ethics by design so that we can design the right framework and the right governance around artificial intelligence in health so that we can harness the best out of it and minimize the risk associated for patients, but many other players uh, in, in the field. And Kathy uh, O'Neill uh, has produced also a very interesting book um, that she calls Weapons of Mass Destruction, as in mathematics, analogically to uh, mass destruction weapons, when you use mathematics uh, improperly to design algorithm which have negative consequences. 
When we look at ethical implication and dilemma, I, I would also like to uh, point out that it's not only negative, they are also positive uh, or, uh, you know, what, what I call ethical benefits to it. Um, AI will allow us to do more personalized healthcare uh, with less efficacy, you know, more efficacy and less side effects will, you know, get us to cover unmet, unmet medical needs, get, you know, drugs and solutions faster and cheaper to patients, uh, you know, do better diagnostic and earlier diagnostic and prognostic of disease and also potentially, you know, help us achieve, uh, uh, you know, access to universal health coverage. So there's a lot of ethical benefit. And I think that not doing it will actually deprive us uh, ethically from those benefits. But there are also a few risks attached to that. If the algorithm are not properly, you know, designed and deployed, you can think about algorithmic bias that would actually uh, favor one type of population or gender or, you know, and, and create some issue around diversity and inclusion are very, very much designed in a way where we don't really understand what's happening inside the black box problem. Uh, and that could create issue around safety and, and beneficence, uh, you know, for, for the patient population. If they're not properly, you know, governed and organized, we could imagine issue around cybersecurity, and we see that every day, uh, but also uh, privacy, which was mentioned before me by Phil. Uh, and so there is a lot of issue all the way from privacy to liability and ownership. Who owns those algorithms? Who is liable for them? if something goes wrong? Is that the designer, the programmer, the distributor, the manufacturer, the prescriber, the patient which is using it? So it creates an entire issue of dilemma along the chain. So if you think about it, um, that actually happened. Uh, a, a country, uh, not to name it, trained an algorithm and made it compete against human being uh, at a medical exam. And they were very surprised to see that the algorithm actually passed the medical exam. So there was this Part of my French oh shit moment, it is a doctor, what should we do? They of course did not grant the, you know, the license to operate as a, a practitioner to the algorithm, but it could happen in, 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 uh, you know, in the near future that potentially algorithm will be able to you know, perform a large number of tasks sim similar to, to doctors. And so what are the ethical dilemma attached to it? You know, because they are actually having influence in, in how they're diagnosing disease, how they're prescribing drug and many others, uh, should they be treated as prescription drug? Uh, what about, you know, when they are influencing public health strategies? Should, you know, what are the protocols for validating those algorithms? Even more complex, you will validate them at a given point in time, let's say point in time A, but maybe six to 12 months later, the algorithm is using machine learning, therefore constantly learning from new data set. And the algorithm is going to be very different at B point in time than A. So should you actually do a, a new process because it's constantly evolving? Uh, can you sue an algorithm? I mean, how, how does that work? Can they own IP? Can you sue them? Who is liable? Uh, that's a very interesting question. We might even reach a future where HEP would be reluctant to use, uh, you know, uh, uh, in diagnostic, any form of classic diagnostic without AI support. And so uh, now it's baking the question, should we have uh, an Hippocratic oath for engineer, not only for doctors, those very engineers that actually are coding and, and working on those algorithms might have an impact on life, public health strategy, providers, payers, and all of us uh, in, the, in the very code that they're actually designing for, for healthcare. So that's very interesting dynamic. And so, uh, you know, my last few slides are around, uh, number one, we need to realize that now in blue technology are following in particular AI, but also many other future health technologies are following an exponential curve. Uh, they are growing very fast uh, in an exponential manner, but in green, legislation and the regulatory environment around us is linear. What that means is we used to have a lot of black and a lot of, and a lot of white in the past, reasonably easy to operate. We're now living in the world with less black and white and more and more gray and even shades of gray. So how do we operate in that complex environment? And regulation is one solution, but is not the only solution. The future is going to be about co-design, multi-stakeholder engagement, consensus framework, uh, ethical guide guidance that allow us to design ethically, you know, AI in particular, but many other future health solutions from the very early stages so that we minimize the negative implication for the entire society and we maximize their potential. And I think that's where the Summit of the Americas, that's a unique opportunity to play a role. Um, and what that meant is historically the focus in ethics was mostly on business ethics and the interaction, you know, we heard about it before today, transfer of value, bribery and corruption and so on. 
Then there was a shift towards bioethics, and we look at diversity in trials, scarcity of resources, human genome editing. There is an entire field which is now emerging called technoethics, focusing on the ethical implication of those technologies. And you can see it's a Venn diagram, meaning that all the three are actually interacting. Yeah? They're not in isolation. Uh, and some of the solution might actually be at the center, uh, combining a number of those fields. So my last slide is um, <clears throat> maybe uh, food for thoughts as the summit of the America will consider some key areas. Uh, I would suggest uh, ethics and you know, uh, of AI and, and data should be a, an area to be considered because of the drastic implication it would have, both positive, but also the risk associated with them to design such a framework. Uh, there is one which was just produced uh, in, in collaboration you know, uh, with WHO. They released a guidance on ethics uh, of AI in health, uh, which is both for the public sector and the private sector, and which is providing a number of principles, which you can see listed here, as well as the subsequent process for embedding them in the very design of, of algorithms and as well the oversight mechanism needed uh, in, in, in health. So you can see protecting human autonomy and making sure that human remain part of the loop. So that's not just the machine, 100%. We have the ability to switch it off, to you know, get in control, have oversight, promoting human well-being and safety and, and, and public interest. Think about benevolence, beneficence, privacy, uh, ensuring transparency, explainability, and intelligibility. Uh, and, and avoiding the black box. We know what the input and what the output are. We don't know what's happening in the middle and how the algorithm came to that conclusion. Very important that we design mechanism for explainability, fostering responsibility and accountability. So we understand who is accountable along the entire chain from development all the way to application of AI, whether that's in public sector or in private sector. And also the collaboration between those two sectors uh, in the future will be essential in public-private partnership, for example. Uh, ensuring inclusi inclusiveness and equity, you know that diversity and inclusion is a big debate. Uh, make sure that those algorithms are not going to favor a given population, uh, you know, or, or be discriminative in both how they are identifying, diagnosing, uh, and, and from many other perspectives. And then also promoting an AI which is sustainable and responsive and, and, and is able to adjust as it evolves over time. So my conclusion is I think it's a unique opportunity for the Summit of the America to consider some of those technologies uh, that will drastically change the way we operate in health uh, and also, of course, have um, dramatic and positive, obviously, implication for patients in healthcare. So let's tackle those challenges now. We're all together, public and private, and design consensus framework that will allow us to come to a solution from a guidance perspective. Andrew, back to you. Wow, thank you so much, Julian. That was an incredibly fantastic overview of the ethics around AI. And I must say the most efficient that I've ever heard in a very, very complex topic, uh, taking us as, as I like to say, you taking us into the gray zone where you say AI is everywhere, it's already here, helping us think through the ethical benefits and the risks, the dilemmas around machine morality. Um, and then of course, the many recommendations that you had for the summit process. So thank you so much, Julian, for your leadership. Phil, too, honored to have you with us. Um, I know that for all members of the audience, if you do have questions or things you'd like to raise, please do reach out to us. I know that both Phil and Julian would be more than happy to, to uh, respond and, and share additional thoughts on these topics. So thank you both again.